All right. Uh, so hello, everyone. This is Vote Her In. Uh, I'm Kelly, and I am joined on Vote Her In by Rebecca Sive, who is the author of Vote Her In, Your Guide to Electing Our First Woman President. We are coming to you today on the one-year anniversary of Joe Biden naming Kamala Harris as his running mate. Uh, so that's an exciting anniversary. And uh, some Midwest storms tried to derail us today, but uh, we've all gotten power back. And I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca now who will introduce today's guest. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Kelly, and thank you. Uh, indeed, we had a little bit of a storm episode earlier, and we're absolutely thrilled that the storm didn't affect the Secretary of State's ability to join us this evening, because Michigan is, as I'm sure she may say, has been a sort of wonderland of things happening in the weather department. So as most of you may know, we are joined today and so honored to be joined by Secretary of State for the state of Michigan, Jocelyn Benson, who's just a remarkable person. And I think we're going to have a very timely discussion about voting rights. Lots has been happening, including today, uh, both federally and around the country. And so we're going to dig right in. But what I want to do is I want to read to you the secretary's uh, bio. And uh, I'm going to read the whole thing that we have here because I really, I was thinking about it before that sometimes we just sort of slide over who these remarkable women are and, and don't take the moment to treasure what they've done and why they're here and how hard they have worked to be able to uh, be such great public servants. So welcome, Secretary, and let me just read this bio and then we'll dig right in. So Jocelyn Benson has been Michigan Secretary of State since 2019, a graduate of Harvard Law School and an expert on civil rights law, education law, and election law. Benson served as Dean of Wayne State University Law School in Detroit. When she was appointed Dean at the age of 36, I can't even imagine this, but hey, that's why we're reading all this. She became the youngest woman in US history to lead a top 100 accredited law school. She continues to serve as vice chair of the advisory board for the Levin Center at Wayne Law, which she founded with the late U.S. Senator Carl Levin. Previously, Benson was an associate professor and associate director of Wayne Law's Damon G. Keith Center for Civil Rights. Benson is the author of State Secretaries of State, Guardians of the Democratic Process, the first major book on the role of the Secretary of State in enforcing election and campaign finance laws. And being the nerdy policy wonk I am, I actually went on the web and started looking at it. And I thought, oh my goodness, when will I have time to read this? Better yet, I get to talk to her myself. So here we are. Um, she is also founder and former co-founder and former president of Military Spouses of Michigan, a network dedicated to providing support and services to military spouses and their children. And importantly, and yay for all the Michiganders who are here who made this happen, she is among four statewide women political leaders, Senator Stabenow, the senior U.S. Senator, Governor Whitmer, and Attorney General Nessel join her who I'm pleased to say has also been here at Vote Her In. So our goal today is to talk about uh, the Secretary's focus on civil rights and voting rights matters. What's at stake for all of us on this front? Some of the lessons learned in Michigan was, as most of you know, really a center for all of these uh, lessons to be learned. And what we should look for and what we should plan on doing as we uh, go towards uh, the 2022 federal elections and of course, hopefully passage of uh, federal legislation on the Voting Rights Act. So I'd like to begin by again saying welcome and asking you this question, if you would, we usually start by asking people, you know, so how did you come to the place where this was the focus of, of your work and including your work here as Secretary of State? So if you would uh, share with us your own journey and then give us a sort of current reading on on how you see things in this arena. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me and, and great to be here. I'm big fans of your work and 
Um, I really appreciate everything you do to promote women's voices in the political arena. I, uh, I actually started my career, well, to step back, my parents are special education teachers. And so mm -hmm. really from them, I learned at a young age how important it is to make sure everyone has a voice and everyone has equal access to our government, to our, our schools, to their right to live up to their full potential. And from there, uh, I went to college and began my career at the Southern Poverty Law Center in mm -hmm. Montgomery, Alabama, where I was investigating hate groups and hate crimes throughout the country. And from there, I really saw how much voting rights and access mm -hmm. to the vote undergrads everything else that we fight for in terms of equity, in terms of access, in terms of opportunity. Uh, and in particular, being so close to Selma, Alabama, where so much was sacrificed uh, so that we could have a Voting Rights Act. Uh, I was particularly instilled with my own personal commitment to do whatever I could wherever I was to continue the work of those who stood on that bridge and be prepared to you know, stand and defend democracy as well and put it all on the line to do so. And ironically, that is what I'm doing right now <laughs> with um, this current state of democracy. But I actually first became an attorney. I went to law school after that because I wanted to be a voting rights attorney. I thought that would be the best way that I could ensure that the right to vote was protected for all by suing anyone who would stand in the way of democracy. And certainly there's an av avenue of that uh, but I started to see secretaries of state and election administrators as those who uh, every day have opportunities to, to protect democracy or misuse the office in a way that would hurt democracy. And we saw that in the 2000 election with Catherine Harris, who made decisions uh, large and small that impacted a presidential election. And so after the 2000 election, I began to focus particularly on the side of election administration. Uh, and that was, I doubled down on that in 2004 when uh, we saw again a Secretary of State in Ohio, Ken Blackwell, uh, who similarly made a lot of decisions. He didn't put enough voting machines in Cleveland and Columbus, leading to eight hour wait times and other things that in impacted the results of that presidential election. So I wrote a book in 2008 on secretaries of state because I was also really impacted, not thinking of occupying the position myself at that point, but how we voters choose our secretaries of state. We choose the people who run our elections. So why aren't we taking that role that we have more seriously to choose people who would fight for democracy instead of standing in the way of it when they get into this office? And so I ran uh, for, you know, I, be, I became Dean of Wayne State Law School. I did a number of things, but ultimately ran for Secretary of State in 2018 with an eye towards doing the job in the way that I felt uh, should be done, not by a politician, but by someone who's simply dedicated to protecting every vote. Uh, and so that's what got me here. And certainly I'm grateful to be here at a time where the same time I was elected the same year in 2018, our state constitution was amended by voters to create a citizens redistricting commission and create a, uh, a um, number of changes to our state constitution that expanded opportunities for people to vote from home, uh, to register to vote up to and on election day. Uh, and so it was a great win for democracy that year. And now we're in the position of defending against those who would like to take that away and go back to the way things were. So can you, uh, just just to follow up on that for a second, excuse me, Kelly, can you just talk a little bit about not only what's at stake in Michigan, but nationally, as you see it from your seat in, in Lansing? Well, we're at a very perilous moment in the history of our democracy, one that comes and goes throughout history, but still we are recognizing that democracy thrives when people are engaged. Uh, and really what, um, what, we have, what we saw in 2020 were a number of things, quite first and foremost and remarkably, uh, a very secure election, uh, a, a highly accessible and accurate election, uh, where more people voted than ever before in our state's history, and uh, where people could uh, trust the results of the election, which they received uh, more efficiently uh, by the counting of our clerks than we even we had anticipated. So all that said, uh, we were also saw in 2020, um, Michigan and other states be targeted by a massive misinformation campaign. Uh, and, uh, and with that, uh, all of the challenges that continue to come with it as people try to undermine democracy and directly interfere with the people's will and the people's choice. And so my job really is to defend and protect our democracy against those efforts, but it's everyone's job as well in our, in our citizenry on both sides of the aisle 
And so a lot of the work right now is engaging citizens, educating voters on what's happening so that they can be engaged as well in voicing their support for pro-democracy agendas as opposed to those who would try to take us backwards. What are some of the lessons then, you know, we've got upcoming 2022 elections, which, uh, you know, could very well tip the balance of the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate. These are really crucial elections. And of course, in state houses. So what are some of the lessons from 2020 and especially sitting where you sat, uh, getting the, the vitriol thrown at you that you got by mm -hmm. by people who are trying to spread uh, this misinformation? You know, what what can we what should we be doing right now to to be ready for that and to counter that? I think the number one thing we should be doing is articulating the truth. Um, what happened in 2020, how that was such a successful election cycle measured by the fact that so many people participated and that the results were, despite significant scrutiny, held up to be an accurate reflection of the will of the people. And uh, over 250 audits that we've done in the state of Michigan underscore that. Uh, and so continuing to tell that story, uh, uh, noting that there are a lot of people who, are, who want to tell another story that's not true and not accurate and benefit off of that. Uh, and secondly, to voice support for the policies that made the election such a success. Uh, the opportunities for people to have options to vote, whether it be from home to the mail to Dropbox or in person on election day, those options were taken, you know, were available to all and all took advantage of them. Uh, so being supportive of those policies and push back against those trying to dismantle those policies is critical as well. Uh, and then finally, for the, um, you know, recognizing what's coming, there is an effort to ensure uh, that the effort to undermine democracy in 2020, which was unsuccessful, returns and is successful in 24, if again, there are people who don't like the results of the, of the people's choice. So recognizing that, making sure, considering serving in democracy in some way, whether it is a poll worker on election day, or even serving as an election authority, an election administrator, and a clerk in your community. All of those are ways that you can play a direct role in protecting the vote because in 2020 democracy prevailed because good people in positions of authority did the right thing. And we need those people to be back again or similarly minded folks to be back again in future elections like in 22, like in 24, to make sure we can again withstand any attacks on our right to vote. And just to follow up, and then I want to ask you a question about the pending federal legislation, but to follow up on what Kelly was saying, was were there any kind of uh, takeaways for you or for your team or for the people who administer elections uh, around the state about how to handle people who who were so opposed to the kind of fairness and democracy that, you know, we treasure? Well, I think it's important to remember the truth is on our side, the history is on our side, the law is on our side, uh, and the majority of people and on both sides of the aisle actually are on the side of truth and democracy. Uh, there is a, probably a third of the people, people estimate half, that works out to about half of, of one party, political party, are on the side of, of, of choosing to believe misinformation. And that's their choice. And it's unfortunate because they've been lied to by people they trust but what we can all do is to continue to simply speak the truth uh, unwaveringly and lead with data and information and voter-driven policies, which is what I'm trying to do and others. And what we've seen is when it's organizations that aren't afraid to speak up or individuals who aren't afraid to speak up. And importantly, speaking up isn't about being political even. It doesn't have to be partisan. It's simply about just making sure everyone can vote regardless of who they vote for and that people can trust the results of the election. Uh, by speaking up about that and by pushing back, by spreading that information, that truthful information, we indeed can drown out the false information. And that's what we experienced as well in 2020. I remember after the election, after the polls closed, we were worried that certain candidates would try to deceive the public by wrongly potentially claiming victory when the voters' votes didn't give them that victory. And so one of the things we did for that entire week after the election polls closed up until when a winner was announced uh, was let people know that votes were still being counted, what the truth was, knowing that if we, if we were essentially, for lack of better words, louder than those trying to deceive the public, our voices would be heard and that's precisely what happened. Uh, of course, what we didn't anticipate was that the voices trying to deceive the public would not go away. Indeed, here we are eight or nine months after the election, and we're still dealing with those 
voices in multiple forms. Um, but the truth remains the same. And our responsibility to tell it has, you know, never been more clear. And speaking of speaking up, can you share with us your views on the federal legislation that's pending and the action that may be taken? And I guess your views also on what we as uh, citizens of care and women activists should be doing to help get that legislation passed. I think number one, no, that the federal government has always had a role as a partner in protecting democracy. That was clear in 1965 when it was in, when enacted the Voting Rights Act. It was clear in 1865 when it enacted the 15th Amendment to our Constitution, demanding that the, or the 19th Amendment 100 years ago, uh, ensuring that women had the right to vote. Uh, so, so that said, the federal government has an important responsibility to play in protecting everyone's right to vote and also in funding our elections, quite frankly. And secondly, the For the People Act, the S-1 legislation that I testified in support of uh, in the U.S. Senate uh, is very much in line with the same policies we have here in Michigan. Uh, policies like election day registration or automatic voter registration, allowing citizens to vote from home and having citizens draw district lines as opposed to elected officials. There's a lot of misinformation I've seen percolate around that particular piece of legislation, S1, and also the John uh, Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, and uh, yet a lot of election administrators support these reforms because we know how important that protection is at a time like right now where there are bad actors in states across the country trying to dismantle democracy and make it harder for people to vote and easier for people to overturn election results that they don't like. So that said, we've never needed the federal government more. Perhaps it's not been since 1965 that we've needed these federal protections more. And that's why it's so important that we demand democracy from our Congress, from our Senate. I was very encouraged today, this morning, to see 50 senators support voting rights reform. And I think, and I'm hopeful, that if people can put partisanship aside and just think about what voters on both sides of the aisle need to ensure their voices are heard, they'll see this legislation is in line with simply that and back it. So uh, switching gears just a, a little bit, we have lots of women who watch and listen who are interested in running for office or being involved in, in public life and in, in uh, you know, social justice movements, things like that. And so we were wondering uh, what sorts of advice you might have for them, maybe some unexpected advice, uh, like go run a marathon when you're eight months pregnant. Uh, but but also, you know, how how you deal with, um, you know, you, you had people outside your house yelling things and, and threatening and, you know, sort of what, what does that look like uh, as we're encouraging women to be in public life? I mean, I think we, we have voices and perspectives that need to be heard. And, um, it, you know, they're different, they're diverse perspectives. It's important that they all be heard because we're all better off when every voice is heard. That's what the, the basic values of democracy require. So um, democracy really is a two-way street. It requires openness, it requires access, but also requires people to be in, informed and engaged. And so by being informed and engaged as a voter or even as a candidate or as an activist in your community, you can play a part in making sure your community is better and that the decisions that are made on your behalf are more informed. So, you know, my advice is to recognize, especially at a time like this, not just that your voice matters, but it's needed. It needs to be heard. I mean, look at the difference that Dana Nessel made because she decided to run for attorney general at a time when so many people told her not to. Uh, the difference our governor, Gretchen Whitmer, has made because she has stood firm following science to protect the public in the uh, you know, global health crisis. Uh, by standing firm, by speaking the truth, by not being deterred, uh, but by simply following our hearts and our intuition to serve, uh, we can truly work together to create a better world uh, and make improvements uh, upon past generations. So my hope is that people who feel that calling to serve in one way or the other, or simply just to be engaged, will follow that because we desperately need good people on both sides of the aisle to be engaged at this moment and to put politics aside, put their country first, and let data and facts and truth guide the policy decisions and other service decisions they make. So speaking of being engaged on a personal note, I'm here in Van Buren County, Michigan, neighbor to Berrien County. And I want to give a shout out to a woman, Ginny Washburn, who is Yay. 
Ah, who, local activists who said, you really should have the Secretary of State on the show. Let's make this connection. And I have to say, you know, when you say we just all have to step up, she is such a great example of that. So many people are, but uh, you know, we just have to keep on working. And to that end, in closing, I want to thank you, but ask you also, if you would, to share information about how we can know about your work, both your governmental work and your political work, and stay in touch and be helpful to you as we can be. Yeah, I mean, I'd love your support. We're all running for re-election next year. You can go to votebenson.com uh, to support my re-election, invest in it, uh, and learn more. You can follow me on Twitter at Jocelyn Benson. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram in the same handle. And, uh, and you know, reach out and let me know what you, you know, ways that I can help you uh, to be um, active in your communities and engaged uh, and informed citizens. We're all in this together. And particularly at this very historic moment when the challenges of our country and our state, be them economic, be them health challenges, be them societal challenges, racial challenges, uh, or just simply the toxicity of this highly partisan moment. Uh, we all can get through this uh, by working together uh, and um, by leading together. And so whatever I can do to help others lead, I'm all for it. And um, thanks for having me on. Ginny's been a great friend and really great to be part of this conversation and for all the work you do to amplify women's voices all across the country and, and here in Michigan. Thank you. Thank you so much and have a good rest of the evening. Hopefully no more storms. <laughs> we'll yes. see. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye.